Okay, so here we go in three, two, and one. I'm Deacon Eric. And I'm Dr. Brett Sockold. And you're listening to Thinking Thinking Faith. Faith. This is a podcast brought to you by the Archdiocese of Regina, where we attempt to navigate this winding road of faith in Jesus Christ so that we might know him more intimately, love him more profoundly, and together serve him more deeply in our daily lives. And here we are once again, week two of our three-week Advent mission that we're offering to you on Thinking Faith. Uh, hosted by myself, Deacon Eric. This is part of a, a mission that uh, I'm hosting at Holy Rosary Cathedral um, at the beginning of Advent, and we thought we would share this with the rest of our listening audience. Uh, when we got together the last time, we looked at how God, as the master builder of all of creation, poured the life of the Holy Trinity, God's own interior activity of love into creation, creating time and space and making a home for us, a home where we, his beloved, could live in the same relationship. And we're going to be carrying this theme on a little bit further to see how, although we were made for love and our hearts are restless until they rest in the heart of love, we come to terms with the reality that sometimes we fall short of that love. Now, also last week, we spoke about how deeply and passionately God has continued to love us throughout our lives, how deeply and passionately he loves you and desires you to share in bringing about what the catechism calls, in that beautiful language, his plan of sheer goodness. And we spend time reflecting on on that big building project of God that's this whole creation and how throughout all of the details of creation, as God is putting together the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth and the oceans and all the creatures that fill it, he had you in his mind and in his heart. Now, at the end of this building project, After all things had been brought into being, God points to the home that he'd made and he declared a feast. He says in Genesis, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that's upon the face of all the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. Isn't this what we do? Isn't this what we do when we gather together our family in our homes? I come from a great Ukrainian background, and every single time we get together with family, there's food. There's a feast. And this is exactly what God does at the dawn of creation, after he's created a home for his beloved, after he draws his beloved together in with him. That's you and I. Once this home has been built, God presents us with this invitation to feast. Feasting in Genesis, as it says, on all the trees and plants of the world given as food for our bodies, that's true, but our church tradition has always read deeper layers of meaning in this. It's seen this, our church fathers particularly, have saw in this, these words, an invitation to feast on all the natural knowledge and beauty of the world all that it has to offer. It's an invitation to feast on the beautiful that is around us, to feast on the philosophy of truth that we can find around us, the arts and the sciences, an invitation to the whole of human flourishing. And remember, this isn't just for our own sake, for our own self-fulfillment. As images of God, this is a feast directed always towards the other. This is God's intention right from the start of all things, isn't it? That we should use all of the gifts that have been placed at our disposal for the good of the other. And isn't that the nature of love? For the sake of the other. This is the image and the likeness of God that all of creation is intended to nourish and empower us to do this. Have you ever found yourself wondering... Wondering, what what is God's plan for me? If I only knew God's will, if I only knew God's desire, you know, if he only made it clear what it was I was put here to do, wouldn't things be so much simpler? 
Doesn't that sound at all familiar? Genesis chapter 1 gives us exactly this. God's dream for humanity. God's dream for you. You were created to be like God. And this, this pouring out of yourself for the good of the other, this is how you do it. St. Paul underscores this when he writes about love, his beautiful treatise on love in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is God's will for us. This, St. Paul says, is how you do the image of God. This is what it looks like in the world. So this is the first thing we know for certain. God's plan for each one of us. We don't have to guess anymore. The second thing we know for certain is that God doesn't seem to get what God wants. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve are placed in the garden and are given particular roles in God's plan. God places Adam in the garden and he says, and, and, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. Now that particular phrase, till it and keep it, that's an interesting one. In Hebrew, it means to work the land and to protect it. Now that should give us a little bit of a pause as all good foreshadowing intends to do, what does the land, what does this story, this family require protecting from? Hold that in your mind for a minute. Of all the feasting that God has invited humanity to, God places a single restriction. You may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you shall die. Now, what's happening here? Is this some kind of toxic plant? Recall the church father's assertion that all the trees of the earth stood in place of all the goods of the natural world, including what we can know about the physical world, the arts, the sciences, philosophies, medicine, all of this placed in the hands of humanity for the good of human flourishing. Save this one, the knowledge of good and evil, knowing what is good and what is evil, setting out really the parameters, the boundaries of good and evil. Essentially, this, this, the, the boundaries and parameters of a moral life, that's left to God alone to determine. And God's warning is if you grasp at this, if you take this for yourself, it will result in death. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, we encounter the snake. And you're familiar with this. Maybe you've seen images in uh, your children's Bible growing up. Uh, and now, our English Bibles translate this as snake, this particular word. In the Hebrew, the word is nahash. Nahash. It's a harsh, guttural word. It's a word that describes not that cute little garter snake that I used to bring home to surprise my mom with, but a large, venomous, draconian-type creature, an obviously threatening foe. This Nahash, this threatening foe, immediately gets to the heart of the matter. He starts calling into question the words of God. Did God really say? Did God really say that you would die if you ate anything? Well, no, God didn't say we would die if we ate anything. We just can't eat this one thing. Oh, oh, you can imagine this conversation. So, so there's one thing God doesn't want you to have. Isn't that interesting? This, this, God, this God claims to love you, doesn't he? Well, you know why. You know why he's withholding. He knows that if you eat it, you'll be like God. And you see what's at stake here. Humanity created in the image and likeness of God or being like God. These two things are brought up into tension through the serpent's questioning. Is Eve going to accept the image of God that's, that's given to her as a gift? Or is she going to try to figure out another way, a way to be like God on her own? The serpent suggests that God's withholding something from them. And though we've been told already that humanity is created in God's image, 
What's being promised by the serpent seems to be a different path, an alternate path, maybe a shorter path, a quicker, easier path. You can be like God another way. And God never told you that. All of this starts to beg a question in their hearts. Can you really trust God? Now, we know Eve eats, but it's interesting. She doesn't eat ultimately because of anything the serpent tells her. Not because of anything the serpent tells her. Listen to what Genesis describes for us. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She took of its fruit and ate. So the serpent didn't have to do any more coaxing than simply placing a little seed of doubt and then showing her something attractive. Now this starts to highlight to us a particular pattern of the enemy, one of the favorite tactics of our enemy. You know, I'm always fond of saying evil and its essence is lazy. It will do the least that it has to do to move us away from God. That little seed, can you really trust God? Look how beautiful this is. Look how delightful that is. Now next, Adam eats. And what was Adam's job? Remember what Adam's job was? Ever wonder where he was when all of this was going on in the very next line? Genesis was told exactly where he was, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, what was Adam's job again? To protect. Rather than standing in the way, rather than protecting the garden and his wife, Adam exercises his will for his own self-interest. Is this the image of God? Is this the image of God? St. Paul tells us, love does not seek its own self, but pours itself out. And this seeking after his own self, his own protection, his own self-interest, results in the loss of grace, the loss of the life of the Trinity, that spirit-filled life of God. Now, the image of God isn't lost. But the grace, the grace that enables this new human family to live out that image effectively, it becomes clouded. Their eyes are opened, we're told, immediately afterwards. But things are not nearly as clear as they had been before. Their vision's clouded. The image of God they were created in is no longer something to be embraced and celebrated, but it becomes a source of shame to be covered up. What happens here with the taking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in essence, is a meal gone horribly wrong. And from this point on, humanity will struggle to flourish. Those things that formerly supported human flourishing from the natural goods of the earth to the arts, the sciences, reason, desire, they no longer sustain us readily. They have a tendency to distract, to obstruct to enslave us. The human condition from this point on through the rest of the story of Scripture and through the rest of our personal story as well becomes defined not by human flourishing but a tendency towards a really disordered and enslaving consumption. And the whole household starts to fall apart. You ever read the Old Testament and you find yourself coming across these awful, awful stories of violence and people doing horrible things to each other, left, right, and center, and people criticize the Old Testament asking, why in the world are these kinds of stories in our scriptures? And this is exactly the point. The point is to underscore just how badly things have fallen apart in the human family, how desperate the situation is. In the world today, I am presented with a host of potential meals to feast on. I'm given the arts, the sciences, reason, and the striving for beauty and truth of philosophy. I'm given relationships with friends and family, relationships with co-workers and strangers, relationships with the farmers who produce my food, the immigrant, the refugee, and the asylum seeker in need of a home. And I'm given technological wonders that put the world and all of her people in the palm of my hand, the world and all of her information at my fingertips. I'm given Facebook and I'm given Twitter and Netflix and Amazon. And our Lord God invites us to look at all that we are feasting on and to ask ourselves, is this feeding you or is this feasting on you? 
Is it helping you to feed others or is it tempting you to consume them? And yet, God is not willing to let us go. So great is his love that immediately he presents a message of hope. And oftentimes in in Genesis, we miss this message of hope. I often tell people, go and and get your Bibles and underscore this passage. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 gives us a key for unlocking the rest of this story of Scripture and the rest of your story with Christ as well. I will put enmity between you and the woman, God says to the serpent, between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head. And the word there is shuf, to snap or to break. And you will strike his heel. This proto-evangelium, this first good news given to Eve, telling her that through her will come one who will strike a death blow to the head of the serpent. Some translations use the word crush to underscore this death blow to the serpent, even as he nips at the heels of humanity. The remainder of our scriptures follows the thread of that promise throughout the ages, and we're introduced to the children of Eve time and time again throughout a myriad of stories in our scriptures, encouraged each time to ask, is this the one? Is this the one? And there's some of the grandest heroes that you'll ever meet. There's some of the most devastating failures as well. They love and they trust and they sacrifice and they hate and they covet and they kill. And through it all, we're encouraged to hold this mirror of the scriptures up to our own selves to see our great need. And through it all, God continues to call, come home to me, trust me, I love you. See, God's intention, we've seen this already up to this point, is to dwell with us and we with him. If we're honest with ourselves, there is a lot that attracts our hearts. This idea of dwelling with God forever. But while there's a lot that attracts us about living with God forever, there's at least as much that concerns us. We can find ourselves in the midst of this restless pursuit of God's rescue plan for our souls. And we find ourselves echoing the words of St. Augustine, Lord, grant me chastity and continence, but not just yet. We know what we need. We're aware of that deep hunger for God that sits restless and unsettled in our souls. But not quite yet, God. Not just yet. Sister Margaret Halaska writes this beautiful poem talking about this very disposition called covenant. And that's what we've been talking about. Really, covenant describes a kind of relationship, a family relationship that God wants to have with his people. And this is how she describes it. The father knocks at my door, seeking a home for his son. Rent is cheap, I say. I don't want to rent. I want to buy, says God. I'm not sure that I want to sell, but you might come in and look around. I think I will, says God. I might let you have a room or two. I like it, says God. I'll take the two. You might decide to give me more some day. I can wait, says God. I'd like to give you more, but it's a bit difficult. I need some space for me. I know, says God, but I'll wait. I like what I see. Hmm, maybe I can let you have another room. I I really don't need that much. Thanks, says God. I'll take it. I like what I see. I'd like to give you the whole house, but I'm not sure. Think on it, says God. I wouldn't put you out. Your house would be mine and my son would live in it. You'd have more space than you ever had before. I don't understand that at all. I know, says God. But I can't tell you about that. You'll have to discover it for yourself. And that can only happen if you let me have the whole house. A bit risky, I say. Yes, says God, but try me. I'm not sure. I'll let you know. I can wait, says God. I like what I see. 
You know, if we're honest with ourselves, if, if I'm honest with myself, the idea of living in com- complete communion with this God, this God who so easily and readily pours his love out upon me, it's far more attractive than actually doing it. When I hear about his love, when I experience it in all of its overwhelming vastness, oh, my heart, my soul, it longs, it hungers for it. When he actually knocks on the door and he wants to move in, then it really, it gets far more real. See, there are rooms in my house I'm excited for him to see. There's places I keep relatively neat and tidy all the time. And then there's my bedroom. And and then there's that spare room, you know, we thought would be great for guests. We thought at home it'd be great for kind of a little study, a little den. But more often than not, when we have company coming over, it's the room where we shove everything in and close the door as quickly as we can. To put it another way, in the opening chapters of Genesis, we saw that we were made for covenant with God and for others. We were made for sharing the divine life. And there are a thousand ways in which I fail to do this every day. I might wish to open some rooms to this covenant, but Christ wants to live in all of them. The fact that we are made for Christ to live in all of them means that we will be forever restless, forever unsettled, forever anxious, so long as we're keeping some of these doors closed. Charles Dickens uses a similar idea when he introduces the character of Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol. Now, he uses a little bit different image. He uses chains instead of doors or rooms, but his sentiment is similar. Having ignored or quashed down this invitation to pour oneself out for the good of others, Marley finds himself doomed to wander the earth, keenly aware of the extent to which his lack of love has increased human suffering and entirely impotent to do anything about it. And when Scrooge goes to defend himself, both defend Marley and by extension himself, extolling the good that Marley had accomplished in the world of business. What does Marley shoot back in reply? If you remember his his enraged response, business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence, these were all my business. The dealings of my trade, and this is such a powerful line, the dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Marley had lost sight of the true calling of the human heart to image our God in every single aspect of our lives, to allow God the freedom to dwell in and remodel, remake, if necessary, all the rooms of this house. Mankind is our business in our families, with our friends and co-workers, the men and women and children who gather our food, sew our clothes, assemble our cars, the poor and the struggling. These are our business. The 70 million displaced persons, refugees and asylum seekers in the world right here today, they are our business And as Marley stresses to Ebenezer, no amount of rationalizing gets us off this hook. Advent is a time for us to open up some of these doors. It's a time, as that wonderful poem we shared, where we encounter a Christ who is infinitely patient and infinitely merciful, and thank God for that. There's a wonderful thing about our liturgical year as a whole I really grew to appreciate this as my wife and I came into the Catholic Church. This whole idea of a liturgical year I thought was magical. Just wonderful. One, seasons like Christmas mean that Christmas isn't just done on a single day. But even more importantly, we get an Advent and a Lent regularly every year. And what does that mean for us? It means God does not come before Eric and say, Eric, you're coming into my church And you got to get your house in order, every room, every spot, every corner, right here and right now today. 
No, what God does in his infinite patience and mercy, as he says, this is a pretty big project. I've stood before some of these messy rooms my kids have had throughout their lives, and I've had this same conversation with them. Maybe you've had them with yourself or had a parent have that conversation with you. Yeah, this is a pretty big mess. But we just need to start in this corner here. And together, together we'll work it out. This is part of the great mercy that Christ gives to us through his church and one of our greatest reasons for hope. This is a time for us to open some of these doors, to dig around, to examine them. And it's okay to look at the mess and realize it's too big for us. Not only is it okay, it's essential for us. As the spiritual exercises begin, and and only after having deepened our appreciation of the great love that God has for us, That's what we did in the first part of our mission throughout this Advent. First, we seat ourselves in the fact that God loves you no matter what. God desires your salvation more than you ever could. Don't ever forget that. Only after grounding ourselves in that appreciation of God's love are we encouraged in the exercises to walk with Christ through the rooms of our lives, taking an inventory of sorts of those areas that require the most work in our home in our home one of those rooms is mental illness and all of the anger all of the resentment all the helplessness that i feel in the face of it several years ago we discovered that our daughter struggled with a condition known as bpd borderline personality disorder it colors The way that she sees the world, it colors all of her relationships. It leaves her paralyzed by fear and anxiety. It leaves her distrustful of those who are closest to her and all of their motivations. It leaves us all feeling overwhelmed sometimes and hopeless sometimes. Now, sometimes we're really, really good at being supportive and compassionate. But sometimes I just get so angry Not just at the disease. I get angry at family members who don't think there's a problem. Get angry with her when when her issues overtake my life. When her needs overshadow my plans. When her illness infects my life. And it's a room I try to close off. I, I try to keep it secret, but sometimes that door just won't stay shut. I don't know what rooms you have in your own house. But Advent is about becoming aware of these, not to despair, but to remember the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for us and know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And isn't that what your heart truly longs for right now? And so this is what I'd like you to reflect on this week of our mission. Take some time to walk through the rooms of your heart with Christ. Which rooms are you excited for him to see? Which rooms are you trying to keep closed? Which rooms are you avoiding? this advent and most importantly which room do you need him to enter most of all I want to thank you for joining us for this part two of our advent mission this week on thinking faith I pray that you might continue to be open to the graces that God has in store for you both through this season of waiting and longing and in the nativity of his son to come. And may God continue to bless you and those you love with a faith that is always seeking understanding. Amen.